Good afternoon, everyone. Here we are once more, another presentation by ABPod, the Brazilian Association of Podcasters, disclosing the results of the Pod Pesquisa survey of producers. Here we have with us Andre Jonatas and Julian Cacino. Andre, welcome everyone. All of you participating live here with us. And maybe you who's watching us in the future when we have this available on our channel on YouTube. We want to disclose the results, draw the balance, and make some plans for next year. Hello, everyone. We're finally bringing up the Pod Pesquisa survey of producers. I will only create problems if I say more. So we're finally here. Not only that, we are also providing a uh, a warning from our president, Kel Bonasoli. Kel, the floor is yours. Hello, Podosphere. 2020, the year that never ends. Well, it's finally coming to an end. 2020 was the year of the pandemic, a year of many losses and forced changes. It was also a year where podcasts grew and became part of the routine of a lot of people. This is the year where the presence of our voices was essential to inform, entertain, and even to warm hearts that were so badly treated. 2020 was difficult for our team as well. Nonetheless, we continued with efforts and commitment. And to close this year out with hope and energy for what is coming ahead on 2021, we have the honor of showing the results of Pod Pesquisa Produtor, the producer survey. And here we are again, and without further ado, let's share the results of Pod Pesquisa. So to start it off, Pod Pesquisa was conducted on 2020. It is part of all the cycle we do with Pod Pesquisa, which involved the survey with listeners and producers. In 2019, we had the Pod Pesquisa for listeners, we worked on it throughout the year. Then in 2020, we launched the Pod Pesquisa survey focusing on producers. And now here we are to show you the results. We had quite a complicated year with the pandemic that caused some delay. These results were expected for the National Podcast Day in Brazil, October 21st. We had a delay, but we hope you understand. So what is the Pod Pesquisa survey for producers? It is a survey aimed exactly at content producers so we can understand what are their needs? What do they need? What are they aiming at? And how can we promote it and give them tools so that the market can provide better products for the producers so that the producers can think about new ideas, providing new information so that they can, in fact, grow so that they can improve their podcasts and improve their content. All of our results will be available on the ABPod website. There will be a spreadsheet there with all the data. And here, this specific presentation will show the main results. This is an overview for marketing personnel and for journalists as well, okay? So we had this year on this survey, we had the participation with respondents from 24 of the 27 Brazilian states. So it represents the country quite well. We collected information from March 14 to October 30. We extended it due to the pandemic we saw that there was this need to extend it. We had over 600 responses, 718 uh, information from the podcast production chain and 111 suggestions for new surveys. So here we have our project director, Mr. Julian Cacino, who is here with us participating right here, right now. I am the IT director and the entire support came from Dimitra Vulcana, or Dan, Karin Vo, and Alini Haki. Our auditor was Thiago Correa. 
PR in our president, Kel Bonasoli, our media advisor and digital media advisor, Andrew Jonatas, designer, Leandro Lima, then the volunteers, Caio Anderson, Bruno Balaco, Rodilson Silva, and Roberto Camara. This entire team worked a lot. So here is the picture of the people who are here, people who were working hard. Dimitra Vulcana helped us a lot with questions on how to deal with LGBT issues, how to be as inclusive as possible. This was amazing. Julian also provided several indications and thank you once more for being here with us and for all the work we've done together. We had a lot of discussions. We had a lot of productive discussions and it was great. Karin, when it came to methodology, she was amazing. She worked on the methodology, on the questions and so on. She was amazing. Tiago, who did great work in terms of auditing us, help us audit the survey. And me here during the hard work. Pamonges. It's important in this moment to thank everyone. It's important to make it quite clear that all the activities of ABPod, the Brazilian Association of Podcasters, is voluntary. So people who are working ahead, they have to invest money, not only their other resources as time and their knowledge. And this year, particularly, was a lot more difficult because we had issues in terms of health, in terms of people who lost family members or friends, issues regarding jobs. So it's important to make it clear. Even when you're going to ask something, when you're going to ask us something and to make a request, you have to understand that the work we're doing, yes, we are committed to it, we will do it to the end, but it's very difficult to do it. So at times we take a little while to answer you back on social media, so be patient. Talk to us directly if you look for the social media and in private. We answer all questions. I do it quite directly. I give people my phone number. We answer emails. So one thing that we really were able to implement was the openness to dialogue. So I really want to thank everyone, everyone who volunteered, everyone who supported us with Pod Pesquisa. Rodrigo Pamondes is our hero. He works heroically. Desk People in Pod Pesquisa is one of our core activities and it's a bigger effort to produce this material. So I'd like to congratulate and, and really boast and say that this Pod Pesquisa is heroic work. I just like to say a couple words, just a couple minutes. This survey for producers, we really wanted to bring it up and do it separately from the answers coming from listeners so that we could truly not be more professional, but show to what extent, what are the different roles of the work and podcast and how they have become diversified. We already had an idea on how to show, how to disclose, how to promote and prove that there was this diversification. And this actually came up. So all the questions were prepared based on several discussions. So, for example, both Tiago and Karin participated with me in creating the main questions. But this went all around. So we have this entire network of people helping us. Just like Bamondes has been working with us since the start in IT, providing support with website, with posts, there's a number of people who want to contribute with their ideas, with their insights. So we had Alini Haki that helped us to have more uh, representativeness, to use this information about podcasting women. Same thing with Dunn and Cutting. So each one brought their own technical side. Tiago as well contributed in many technical aspects regarding the material, for example, of the producers. So it was complex to 
provide a response to it, but it provides us with a lot of resources. It's not the view of one or two people, but a whole network. We want to maintain this network because all of us who are podcasters, we're helping each other. We are trying to make things better for everyone. So this is basically what I had to say. And to compliment on what you both have said, we would really like to have more volunteers to work with us, whether with sign language interpreting when we are disclosing the results. Yes, there are deaf people who are uh, following up on podcasts. They go along podcasts that have the their transcription of the content. There are people who are interested in this topic. We have been talking with thematic groups, for example, for black podcasters, uh, native Brazilian podcasters, or women podcasters. The idea is to have many views, broad views, so that everyone can feel that ABPOD, the Brazilian Association of Podcasters, has as its main goal to promote and advocate for podcasters. So it is only fair that everybody has to feel welcome here at ABPOD. So if you believe that you have an idea or that you can help us with something, please, we have our contact information on the ABPOD website. Contact us. Same thing with the research data. There's uh, the contact information if you have any questions, something you want to send us, some information that maybe is not clear on the spreadsheet, whether for this year or for previous years. Don't hesitate to contact us. So uh, we'd like to thank our partners from RWCast, Agencia Radio Web, NinjaCast, the o Povo de Comunicação Group, and Abergi, the Brazilian Association of Corporate Communication, and our dear producers who helped us with this survey. Cynthia Bailey, Samir Duarte, Rodrigo Alves, Tato Tarkan and Professor Mauri, Fernando Caruso, from Podcrastinadores and Caverna do Caruso, Kelly Bonasoli, Sexo and Gintas, and Rodrigo from Big Tree. Some of our activities in the production chain for podcasts. Andre, since you were the one who, who created this, can you please give us an overview of it? This is just a broad overview of the responses we got. We got responses from several other activities, but here I think we can have those that had the most responses, the largest number of responses, giving an idea of what people are doing, what are the activities, Consolidating, many of them we were aware of instinctively, but with this survey we can consolidate that. We have people writing scripts, doing production, design, doing editing, audiovisual editing, hosting. We have columnists. We had a lot of people saying that they're columnists. Probably it's someone who sends their audio to participate, even if they are not a member of a podcast. Even the cover image, which or some only call it cover or thumbnail, there are several words to refer to it, but the area that is connected to visual assets to attract people. So direction, creation of soundtracks, social media. So this helps us understand how important social media is in the production chain. This is important so that in the future we can start to think about how much is this work worth so we can create prices for podcasting to try to obtain sponsors or to have a media kit. All of this is important to consolidate things that we already knew intuitively, but now we have a more formalized based on the responses from producers. Something that we have learned by looking at it is that it's true. It's very difficult to do it all by yourself, to do it all well by yourself. So most of the podcasts, the podcasters that are and producers that are becoming professionals in the area, they are separating one or more activities and outsourcing a few of them. And this 
paves the way for people who are specializing in one or more of these steps in the production chain. And this is quite interesting. Then we have the social and economic profile of the people who responded to our survey. We have 85% of people who live in Brazil and 15% live abroad in several countries. United States, Canada, Germany, Italy, France, Japan, Chile, Ivory Coast, Finland, New Zealand, and so on and so forth. Something that was quite interesting from this is that many people who have left Brazil are still producing podcasts in Portuguese, are still producing content for this audience, and this is a way to keep their connection with Brazil. And this is very interesting. This is one of the the points where it diverges from the uh, listeners survey because we had about 4% of people listening abroad and we have 15% of producers. So there are many people who live abroad, but they have things to say to people who live in Brazil and speak Portuguese. They're keeping their connection to their country, to their roots. This is very interesting culturally. Wherever you are, we are producing content. Gender issues in the responses we had approximately men and women and uh, out of every four answers three were from men. We had people who said they were non-binary but it was quite a smaller number. Women were almost a fourth of respondents. Most people were heterosexual but we had other uh, sexual orientations. When it comes to self-declaration we have a growth here. Both uh, black people and uh, brown people are growing proportionally. Oh, they're growing over time. And we believe that this is due to the growth of podcasts. They are embracing more people and working with self-declaration. I think that this is quite interesting as well. On the screen here, I think it's important to highlight Bamondes that this view here is challenging. It provides us a view of what we need to work on. We need to have more inclusion to increase the diversity and provide balance. I can't even assess if this is positive or negative. Apparently, this is negative because we see a large difference. However, the main factor here is that this provides us a guiding star. We have 58% of white people, which is more than half of all other ethnicities. 75% men in the producers. There is something very important to be worked on here. I think that this difference gives us uh, an idea of what we have to work on. There's no question about it. To complement what you've just said, and to avoid repeating ourselves, we are saying this based on the responses, which are an extract of the producers. This does not represent all producers, but this is a relevant number. Over 600 responses, it's a statistically relevant number. Also, as we said at the start, we covered almost all states, and that's relevant as well. But this is an extract, and this is more closely related to our social media, to the people who follow us. And it's more related to independent podcasts. Maybe other participants from traditional media, mainstream media are not here, but for a social economic profile, this is irrelevant. This was a lot worse in the past, but it's still unequal. This is a point that we can draw the parallels between the listener's survey and the producer survey. And what can we say? We can see that we are still quite outside of what would be normal in Brazil, what would be statistically representative of Brazil according to the Brazilian Institute of Statistics, but we're drawing closer. It's bad because we're not equal yet, but at the same time it's good because we're moving in that direction. Something that's quite interesting. Some of the estimates in the world estimate that around 15% of the population is not cis-normative. 
so these are people who are non-binary or somehow related to LGBTQ. And in the pod survey, we can see that we have that we have approximately 15% of our respondents, 14.9% among people in the LGBTQ groups and the non-binary. So in this point, I thought it was quite interesting. We are at least close in this topic to something that is more uh, approximate to the real population. I think it's important to improve on these questions and maintain them so that we can get all the responses, but also draw comparisons with the next surveys. Now discussing the monthly family income, more than a fourth of the producers has an income that is between five and 10,000 reais per month. So adding up from people who have from 1,000 to 3,000, look how interesting this is. From 1,000 to 3,000, 24%. From 3,000 to 5,000, 23.6%. So in three, from 1,000 to 10,000 reais per month, we have almost 73%, almost 74% of the producers. So it's a wide range. Maybe we have to change this question to get more details from it. But what was interesting is we have a concentration in this, in, which is above the Brazilian average. According to the Brazilian statistics, we use the minimum wage, but can, we can convert it. The podcast producers in general have an income that is above the average from the Brazilian Institute of Statistics. So this is interesting to see in this point. There's one thing that caught my eye here, Bamondes, Julian, and members of the audience, which is the diversity of income. The possibility of creating a podcast going from zero to a lot of money is reflected here. So we have different ranges of income producing podcasts. And the majority range here, if you compare it to the salaries, it is approximately the middle class. It's not upper middle class nor upper class. So the majority are not rich nor poor, it's the middle class, in, according to the classification of Brazilian Institute of Statistics. But we can see that there is this flexibility to reach all levels of income producing it. So you can produce podcasts even if you don't have large income. Yes, and we have been following this and we have been seeing that there are many new tools coming into the market making it easier to create podcasts. So this has been helping with this number. Then of course, we have the participation of producers per region. We were expecting we would have a large number here in the Southeast region because this is the concentration that happens in Brazil in general with access to the internet. We depend on access to the internet. So we expected we would see that a large concentration here in this region, but we had very pleasant surprises, both in the Northeast region of Brazil and in some states of the Northeast, we had very interesting surprises. Ceará and Bahia, two states that have led that. This was very great to see. And of course, this is a picture of Brazil's inequality in terms of human development in each of the regions. Yes, we need to grow proportionally more in the Midwest and the Northeast and the North region of Brazil. We will have to think on how we can do that. Let's talk to regional leaders because yes, we need to do that. My understanding is that we need to grow in terms of representation in a proportion to the population. But this also reflects a reality, as you've said, as in the economic profile which is a number of limitations that are in the production regarding internet, technological conditions that are related to that. So these numbers are normal for the Brazilian situation. There's a curiosity here 
to complement it. Northeast had more of a representation than the South, which is inverted in the listener survey. The South has more listeners than the Northeast. So this is interesting. It's important to highlight here that there was uh, a prevalence of from the states of Pernambuco, when we talked about the Northeast, this is what led the other states. Pernambuco still is in the top, but recently, Ceará, we have been doing a lot of work in that state, and Bahia as well. They have started growing. So we have from Pernambuco, we have the greater diversity even in the Northeast region. And it's important to highlight the state of Sergipe as well, because it started growing and it's one of the smallest states in the Northeast. I think it's the smallest actually. And it has a good level of production. We have Actor doing great work there. And this is awesome. One state leads the other. I am from the Northeast, I'm from Ceará, and I can say it with a lot of propriety. But this can be reflected in other regions. A state can lead the way, be the example, and others can follow, and so on. But it's important that there is greater diversification. Yes, no question. And something that's interesting to us is to understand how this environment where a few producer creates a, a core of representation, it promotes the creation of new podcasts. It truly promotes the creation of new content, the formation of new people who will participate, whether it is in a specific podcast in their state or in podcasts with people from many other states. So this work is quite important. This groundwork, this grassroots work that has been conducted in Sierra for several years. In Bahia, it has been gaining speed in the last few years, the last year and a half, two years. We could truly see that statistically based on the responses. So this is great. I hope that Sergipe, uh, with Actor doing his work, with him in the lead and other people leading, we will have a growth. Maybe in the state of Paraíba or Rio Grande do Norte. We have lots of places in. Pernambuco, I, and we hope we will start accelerating again. It led for the longest time, and now it's still one of the leaders, but we want to see more. We always want to see more because we know that there is a very important community there and they can do more. So here we have the breakdown of participation per state, showing the percentages per region. So this is the percentage per region. So you will see that we have different percentages. One is greater than the other, but we're talking about regionally and they're not their overall participation. In Northeast, we had Ceará e Bahia leading and Bahia in a tie with Pernambuco. Maybe two years ago, we could not even have imagined that, but this happened. Rio Grande do Sul leads in the South region, but Paraná is already close to Rio Grande do Sul, Santa Catarina. I'll, I'll even get the chimarrão, the beverage from the state of Rio Grande do Sul, to celebrate it. Maybe next time we will do the Pod Pesquisa for listeners with people from the whole of South America. Who knows? Maybe we can do that. Sao Paulo currently has a large number of... Uh, producers, but there's something interesting here. Every year when you do the pod pesquisa, both, both for listeners and for producers, we can see a reduction in Sao Paulo's lead because the other states are growing. It's not a decrease from Sao Paulo, it's actually that the other ones are growing. Sao Paulo is getting closer to its ceiling. So Sao Paulo grows from 100 to 110 producers and the other states are going from 2 to 10. So we can see a difference in fact, but it's great to see the, these numbers. And now talking about behavior. Most of our producers still are multitasking. Our producers are still the host, the editor and the producer. So a third of the people 
to the podcasts by themselves. Then you have columnists and so on. But there's this producer doing this, doing everything because they love it, which is great. However, we need to understand that these people need, that's something I'd like to say, these people need to get a hug. At times they do all of that and they are still there, the colonists in their own podcast or someone else's podcast. So almost half of the of our producers are doing everything. They're doing everything they can. They're putting all that effort in to release the podcast. Some, around 6.5, are hosts and producers. We'll see that there, there's coherence with some of the results we will see later on. When we look at the patterns for the uh, allocation of funding and so on, there's a connection to that. But I'd like to mention that the data we are showing here, we will provide a PDF file, a five-page PDF, if I'm not mistaken. So you can download it and send it through WhatsApp, publish it on, on your website, on your podcast. We, we did with one of our friends, a designer, Leandro Lima, and I'd like to thank him. But this amazing material, this very beautiful material will be in your hands in addition to the Excel file. We had an evolution from last year. We realized that we needed to have a more concise material that could be easily shared. But the Excel spreadsheet is very important because it has all the data. And please remember, all the data are anonymized. There are no names on it. Exactly. The data from previous surveys are also available on the website if you are interested in it. And our idea is to allow everyone to have access to it so you can look at it, understand the data. And if you want to infer more from the data, feel free to do it. So preference for free or own hosting. Currently, we have a situation where we had a change. Anchor joined the market a few years offering free hosting. And out of the producers that are part of the extracting pod pesquisa, they are a large portion of answers. I think it's interesting and we will show it a little more onwards. But look as at how much own hosting and blubber have been decreasing in the number of responses. This is associated to some of the responses without giving spoilers, but this is connected to newer podcasts, I think. That's a possibility. I think here it is important to reinforce that Anchor, Pamon just said that it's here for a few years, but just to make it clear, it, Anchor has about two years after Spotify purchased it, I think two or three years, that it is making hosting, editing, recording, everything for free, for now. I'm sorry, should I not have said that? No, no, no. We're free to say whatever we want. So there is this possibility of having free hosting. Personally, I've always had my reservations about things that are everything for free. I started working with podcasts in 2014. People who have been working with it for more time than I have. Free hosting is always risky, so we need to say that. It is inclusive. It provides possibilities for people who do not have resources to create their podcasts and share it and be a podcaster. But at the same time, we need to remind people that there are other experiences in the past. Bamon just can share something about it. But there are experiences in the past about losing material, podcasts being taken down, and free hosting. With Anchor, I don't think this will happen because it's backed by a large company, Spotify. But my opinion is that sometime you will get the bill for it. So you have to be cautious if you're going to leave your podcast entirely in the hands of free hosting. Whether it's Anchor or whatever other hosting that might be available for free. That's perfect. So continue with the behaviors. Now we have the trends. What is the 
distribution. These new producers, as you've mentioned here, the producer may make it available in more than one platform. So, of course, the sum of its parts go over 100%. Spotify has everybody joining. We have a little more than 13% of producers who are not yet on Spotify. There's one interesting thing here, and it's coherent. Among our audience, the audience that responded to the survey, we realized that a few of the producers, as they create a structure and they start making a living with podcast, particularly living directly off of the results that they get with their podcasts, maybe due to security issues or something, they stop participating in the survey. So this is a an overview here. Even people who are not responding to the survey tell us a lot about the survey. So here we have Spotify, then iTunes. Even if we only have 5% of iPhones in Brazil, I think it's 3 to 5% of the phones in Brazil are iPhones, iTunes is still here because one way or another, iTunes is still the search engine used by many of the aggregators that we use on Android phones. And we can see that iTunes has stepped off the gas a little bit. Spotify has stepped on the gas, but since aggregators are still connected to it, it'll still show up very strongly. And it's called Apple Podcast. It's no longer called iTunes. This is something interesting. When we started the survey way back when, it was still called iTunes. So I have to make a disclaimer here. It's a changing name, but it's the same product with a different name. Another very interesting thing, and this was driven by the pandemic, the question of podcasts on YouTube. This is very interesting to comment on. YouTube and Twitch. During the pandemic, people are quite interested in listening to your content, and they're still interested in that. And I believe that due to the social distancing, if they can, they also want to see your face. So even if we are, in general, generating content that is simply made for audio, you can ignore the video. If you can have this content on a video format, this helps you in two different ways. First, because YouTube is highly indexed. It's quite easy for people to find you by accident on YouTube. Same thing happens with Twitch. I'm mentioning YouTube, but I mean video channels, video submission services, and streaming. They are very important for that reason. You start being seen. And when your audience has the possibility, they want to see your face. They want to see you interacting with someone else. So yes, it is helpful. It has been helping. Working with the results of the survey, I started applying some techniques that we noticed here, and I'm actually seeing some results. It is quite interesting. Please understand, is your content audio? Great. Please understand that you can take advantage of the availability of video, the need for interaction that people currently have. Take advantage of that as well. Take advantage of that knowledge be seen. It's another channel, another way for you to be distributed on, to be seen on, and to share your content. Because you will create a link to your podcast, your link for Google Podcasts or for your RSS, and people will follow you. And it's great. Julian gave an interview recently to the tech channel, Canal Tech. It's a very interesting a news piece, and this is what he said. Any format that can contribute so that podcasts can be seen, can be remembered, can be known, to can even be found and indexed, that format will be welcome because it's another way you have to get attention to your content. So this is very interesting. Right. People are asking about the results on the website. We will publish them. We have a list of next steps 
just to let everyone know, everyone who's watching us live. Well, what happens? New generation of producers. Over 70% of the producers who responded started after 2018. We had already noticed that based on the listener survey. Because on the listener survey, we have over 7,000 different podcasts in the responses. We were able to see that difference at that time. We could not work with it, even because of an issue that we changed our methodology. In 2018, we done with at most five podcasts, and now you were able to name as many podcasts as you wanted and as many as responses as you wanted to. Right, and that changes it a little bit. But we could tell, we could realize that there was a major growth and this has been demonstrated here by the number of new producers. And of course, no one is going to produce a podcast that is not heard. So producers starting from 2018, very important. Podcast as a hobby, but this is changing. Why? Two thirds of our producers say that they do it as a hobby. At the same time, Everybody understands or a lot of people understand that they do need a source of revenue. Yes, it's great to produce a podcast. I like communicating with people, but you get to a certain point where you need to have a return to be able to maintain that product, to maintain it at a constant pace to help. So podcast is a hobby. Yes, but people are trying to find revenue sources of revenue. And then we have 14% have revenue paying the costs. 4%, almost 5% work with podcasts to supplement their income. So the podcast is already providing an important level of income for these people. This is also important to warn producers. You probably will start this way. Even if you're thinking about becoming a professional, or even if you already have an idea to produce, to generate income, this will happen over time in with professionalization because independent producers work with this idea of complementing their income or as a hobby. Even if you think of it as a business from the start, every business has its time to grow until it has its uh, break even point or until you start bringing in revenue or income. Even if you think of it as a business, you have to have an expectation that it will take some time. What I find interesting here is that you have a diversity here in terms of interest and objectives with the podcast. And it's interesting to see that 24.7% already have some revenue. We do not have a point of comparison because many of the questions were new for the survey, for this producer survey, but I don't know if the percentage was this high before. We may think that it's low compared to others, but if 24.7% already have some revenue, there is a possibility there. I think this, this is interesting to highlight. Okay, and that's right. If we add up everyone here, we have 5.4, 10.1, It's a large volume of people that have some income, a, a quarter of it in practical terms. Exactly, it's an interesting volume. And what happens here is that we have a lot of large producers that are no longer participating in Pod Pesquisa. And as I say, sometimes the absence will tell us something. There are old producers that have gotten to a break-even point. They have gone beyond it. Of course, since they're not providing their data, we can't make up data for them. But it's very interesting to see that people who are living off of podcasts, making a living, we have a relevant percentage of people who are not in the survey. So this number is even bigger. There are very interesting podcasts that are making a living off of it, thank God. I don't want to offend any large producer, but to be honest, it's not statistically relevant. Yes, of course, that's true. They already have data, but 
it's better if they don't respond. I'm not saying anything against Renata Lopretti or Azagal. Nothing against them. But that's not the purpose of the survey. No, no. Well, they are outliers. It's not because of income. That's not the, the point of it. There's the issues of time for production and other aspects that are relevant. Even more than this aspect. But statistically, they are not quite relevant. CJK Lira is commenting here and he's actually asking a question. Can you tell me what topics have been growing since 2018? In the listeners survey, we have these topics more precisely drawn. In Julian's interview, it has been said that journalistic topics have been growing, topics related to politics or causes, topics related to sex. They were a lot of the answers that we got from people. So there are these new topics that have been coming up. On the website, abpod.org, you can download the full data and you get further detail. Here we have the activity of the producers. Because the producers have other activities. They are journalists, they are advertisers, they are lawyers, and they have their podcasts. So there is this profile. So here we will see this profile from the producer. Let's continue. And again, going back to how people provide that revenue. Half of them still do not have any resources or they do not get collect resources. 12% already have some type of patronage. Others have the ads. Some have patronage plus ads. So there's a point where we have a large percentage of people that only work with it as a hobby. But there's a transition point, um, a point of maturity. And I understand that this is an opportunity, even for companies such as Colaboroi, even Patreon itself in some scenarios, that create this intermediation to uh, raise funds. There is a large market that is not being explored with these producers. I understand that if these companies that have this mediation, if they show that they have some service or some way, something that is focused more on podcast producers, this will have a positive response. Basically, half of the market, each one of them, Patreon, Apoyacy, Collaborae, they could double their participation when it comes to podcasts. So think about this. If I could talk to the CEOs of each one of these companies, I would say, look what you're letting go by. Look at here. The insertion of ads, this is very small. There's still a lot of potential to grow here. Oh, we hear about the podcast market that it will move X number of billions in the United States or in Brazil. Where is this money? Because when it comes to insertion of ads, of course, then we as producers have to do our homework. We have this connection with agencies, with large companies to show, oh, we reach an audience, we are relevant, we have engagement, we, your brand should be with us. So we need to do some work in terms of ad insertion. Very good. And here we have the situations. Communication is the most occurring in activity. Most of the producers has one or two podcasts, but there are producers that work in up to 12 podcasts. Look at that. And people's occupations. 13% work with communication, 12% teaching or education, audio and video production. Look at this. This is so interesting. We have many more communicators than people who are truly experts in audio and video. We have a small number, proportionally it's a small number of people producing audio and visual. People in technology, if we add both of them up, it's 20%, but it's a fifth of the market. But the other categories here have a lot more people. That is, it's quite interesting to see that. This is something that I had a different bias. I thought this would be different, that it would be a different profile. Personally, I talk 
communication and technology would dominate and I was wrong. This has been a change, a change that has been happening. People in communication have been starting to work with podcasts. Before, we had people from other areas. People from IT, from technology, had a greater penetration in podcasts. And we can see journalism, for example. Journalism is growing. Law. Law has 4%. I can't remember, I don't know if it was growing. However, these other activities are growing. So podcasts in this aspect are no longer something related to technology. They're not related directly to audio and video production. Now it is becoming something related to communication, which it is at the end. We're always communicating. This could also be related to the fact that before you needed to understand a little bit about technology to do it. And if you were already working in this area, it was easier to you. Now, a lot of uh, barriers to entrance were broken and it makes it easier for people in other activities to join. Yes, there's no doubt about it. Simplicity. For whoever started back in 2005, 2008, podcast was something out of this world. As a listener, the first podcast I listened to, I didn't even know what podcast was. It was in a cast. A friend of mine showed it to me and I was like, what is it? I didn't even know what that was about. So this represents a difference from the moment we have simplicity. When it's simpler to make content, it's getting to a situation where we truly have people from other areas, communication, they are joining podcasts which is great for us. There we go. Production companies are not often used. This is another interesting aspect. Over 70% do not use a production company. However, and I only have 10% using it. Is this a market for production companies? Yes, to the extent that people who are doing this as a hobby, they are migrating. They, from the moment that they start making the content more professional, they need to outsource some activities, whether it is the cover, the production, writing, whatever. So this is a market opportunity, a huge market opportunity. Some people, when we talk to them, they didn't even know how to answer that because sometimes they hire one person and they don't understand that contractor as a production company. But maybe that person sees themselves as a small production company. For us who are following the market closely, it might be so for a few cases. The person started as a producer, producing podcasts for other people, editing or preparing some aspect and then all of a sudden they have too much work and they hire someone else and it starts becoming truly a production company with, with a full name for it. And I hope that a lot of the people who did not know how to reply, how to respond to this question, did not know how to do it because they are in this transition, moving from being something where I am outsourcing something to someone to someone who's actually starting their own production company. Would you like to say something about this? I think in during a pandemic, we cannot be too demanding on this aspect. I think everybody did whatever they could, but I think this is a trend. But of course, we had a worldwide situation that made the scenario change and everybody had to hold back. But I believe that this is a trend it is a lot easier in technical terms to simply create this structure. I work with a corporate communication and the company where I work is associated to the Brazilian Association of Corporate Communication, which was one of our partners in disclosing this survey. And there's a survey showing that there's a growing number of corporate podcasts, company producing their podcasts. When you move on to companies, even if the company is large, it does not have a large team and a skilled team to produce podcasts. So as a rule of thumb, they hire production companies. So this is proportional to the number of companies that are launching their podcasts, having this growth of 
use of production companies. We can associate that. So as more companies produce their podcasts, they need more production companies to produce their podcasts. That's perfect. There we go. Here are the next steps we are going to take from now on when it comes to the Pod Pesquisa, right? That's right. Today we are showing the results of the Pod Pesquisa for producers. Next week we will have these results in English and Spanish on the website. And from here to here we will have everything available on the website. We will upload many things from today to tomorrow. From December 17 on, we will have conversations with regional leaders. We will have lives with regional leaders, with thematic groups. The idea is to have a conversation about the issues of producers or issues related to our survey. So we can continue the conversation. Okay. We close the cycle here, January 31st. We start the preparations for the Pod Pesquisa 2021. We hope so, at least. And the idea is to work from this point on, working to have the results on October 21st, the Brazilian Podcast Day, to have the results then. We could not do that due to the pandemic in 2020. We hope that in 2021, we will be able to do that. We hope we will have the vaccine soon, that everybody will be okay. I hope that by the end of December, at the end of last year, I hope we will be talking about the future and aligning everything with the producers in the next activities. So the next steps, they are subject to adjustments. We were at the beginning of the year and we were saying, no, we will deliver everything on October 21st. Everything will go right. And then we had the pandemic and then the universe came to us and said, nope, you're not the boss of anything. Exactly. You don't know the half of it. Just because of that, you will be grounded at home. We hope that in 2021, we will be able to follow this schedule, this timeline closely. There might be a few adjustments, one week ahead, one week delayed, but this is the idea in general. Of course, now drawing the balance for 2020. How did the AB Pod management go? We participated in the podcast movement out in 2019, bringing content to the site and social media on the topic. We conducted the Pod Pesquisa for listeners in 2019. We launched it. We relocated the results in AB Pod Super Live. We participated in Podcast Arena Campus Party. We wanted to present the data at YPod just to give you an idea how frustrated we were. We did not have the meeting, we did not have anything, but we moved on. For you that have been following us since the start, Karen, who was a essential part at YPod, she's part of the women podcasters. We wanted it dearly because YPod is a great partner as a regional leader at AB Pod. So we really hope that this year in 2021, we will be able to do so. We had the arena podcast at the campus party digital edition. We curated and participated at pod play an event of the Ninja cast network. It was incredible to everyone at Me media Ninja. We have been talking a lot to them. We interviewed in several different media outlets in all sizes and shapes. We made the results available for university students and other students, and this is very important. If you have a student, if you know someone who need data, the Pod Pesquisa data, both for the listeners and the producer survey, that's what they're here for. Talk to us, ask us. If you don't know about it, contact us. We spend hours explaining some topics so people can use it in their teases, in their papers. We're open to that. Bamonges, just to supplement here when it comes to responses to university students or other students, this is related to several emails and messages that were building up before we joined. There was a buildup of questions, requests, and so on. And we answered all of those. We are zeroed out. And now we can 
reply with more agility. If anyone who's listening here contacted us, they know we reply. Even if we just say, we do not have this, we do not have this done, we are not expecting that, but we will reply. This type of work here with people from universities, with students, this is something that is not made by all management because this is a long-term work. This is something that you will do now and only way ahead in the future, someone will look into it and find those data that were made available. So we are 100% open to talk to you. Whether you are from the press, we are, have been giving a lot of interviews. We take turns. There are days where we have to split it up between us because we can't have a single spokesperson. We are open to conversation. We are replying to everyone. That's right. Support and the, the promotion of crossover of Black Podcasts, which was amazing. And I didn't talk about Assuntar. Do you want to say something about Assuntar, André? Assuntar is a podcast marathon from Ceará. It was conducted in 2019. Over 160 people watching it from 8 in the morning to 6 in the afternoon. We had a number of items of content. Mostly everything was local. It was conducted by Caramelo Comunicação. I was participating. We always have the institutional support of AB Pod. And here I want to comment something. If you're doing an event, talk to us. Show us what you want to do. We will assess it and we will support it if we can. Institutionally, we will help promote it. We will do curatorship. Even in terms of the event format, one of the things that I think that we have a slide telling us what we will be doing in the future, we will tell you more about that. But this week, we don't have that slide, so I'll, I'll, I'll share it here with you. This week, we have three days of Assuntar in the network. Since we could not do it in person, we did it online, a one hour and a half live session, three days in a row with different topics. We reached around 600 people in three days which was very interesting. It's local content about podcasts. It was for a niche. It was online. It was great. And this can incentivize you do regional events. You don't always have to think big and think nationally. We have been betting on regional things like at Asuntar and the event was great. We had that support from AB Pod. We want to create uh, some centers for next year, some cars. Next year, we want to create this action with uh, entrepreneurship. We want to have a center for legal uh, issues, for registration, a diversity center. We, have, we want to create several of these centers or groups to decentralize some topics. This is one of the things we're considering for next year. There are other items that we are also considering for next year that I think we should mention here. For example, regional lives, such as Bamon just mentioned. We want to have monthly content on legislation. We are already talking to a lawyer's office. If there's any lawyer, any legal operators who want to talk to us, we will not seal the deal with a single office. Talk to us. We want to have content providing advisory to producers, to members. We want to have a program for contributing members. From the moment we're thinking about formalizing an institution, we will have costs. To up to this moment, we can absorb our costs. If we become an organization, we will have fixed costs. We are already moving ahead in creating our tax identity, formalizing our institution, and we will have fixed costs. So we will create the idea of a contributing member, also having non-contributing members. So don't worry. If you're already a member, nothing will change for you. We will create a possibility to contribute a type of sponsor so that these people will have some returns on their investment, something else than non-contributing members. But you will live together, both contributing and non-contributing members. Uh, periodical newsletter with information and we also want to conduct training sessions, courses, and the AB Pod podcast. We can't have the cobbler's kids walking around with no shoes. These are some of the plans we have for next year. As Bamondi said, 
the plan is a guidance document. There's a lot of issues, there's a lot of variables that can make it be delayed, make us rethink it, make us move it ahead. But it is important to know that we are going on full steam ahead. Even though we had a pandemic that made us delay some things, put some things aside, we did not move at the speed we wanted to. We are active, we are available, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we are open to having volunteers. We have these opportunities. A lot of people are coming over. They're helping us with different topics. Just like we can be a great stage for you to present something and as and have an idea, as Andres said, we also need people to help us technically in some areas. Not only in law, but in other areas as well. So contact us to complete here. So because we're drawing closer to the end of our live. There is a lot of contact. There's a lot of connections we make that we do not promote because these are processes that need to be consolidated so we have something solid to present. Oh, we had a meeting with Spreaker to try to do something and it doesn't come to fruition. So we are paying attention to what's happening we know what are the topics, what are the desires of the producers, of our members, but we need to consolidate things before we promote them safely. We have a lot of negotiations, contacts, we have suggestions. Some people slam the door on us, other people open the doors for us, and we keep going on and conducting our activities. That's perfect. Now to end our our topic here. Look at this. We are still working with the listeners. This is a very interesting piece of data. Take a look. In the research group, we continue to do the audience analysis based on the pandemic. I think something that many producers felt is that up to April, May, we had a large decrease in the number of listeners. In lots of cases, people were adapting to this new normal. They were adapting to how they would deal with the pandemic. But after this decrease, we noticed that there was a new increase in the number of listeners and in the number of minutes listened to. People were listening to it, but were not listening to a lot of it. And there was a major increase. And we saw that by, the, by early November, we broke a new record in terms of uh, searches for podcasts. Additionally, many platforms are reporting uh, expressive growths from 16 to 100%. Of course, we need to validate that. We need to see what the effective growth was. But being sure, as we are today, that in 2019, we had 17 million listeners, over 17 million listeners. We're talking about an audience that can go up to 34 million listeners in Brazil. This is amazing. Between 20 and 34 million listeners in Brazil. This is a very expressive figure, a very expressive number of people. This is a figure that is worth it. Even if we had not grown by a single listener in 2020, even if we had the same 17.3 million listeners that we had last year. This is already a very expressive figure. So it's worth producing. And it's important to highlight here. In our promotional material, we have the links to the research that was considered to create this estimate. And it's up to 34 million. This was validated with specific research. This is an estimate that Bamondes and the team here created based on other research. And it's coherent with the number of producers that has been growing. And it's coherent with the searches on podcasts. So these are data that are available. They were cataloged. And the statistical calculation was done by our team at Podpesquisa. And it's really worth taking a look. Uh, we can see that groups that have platforms such as YouTube, you can track how many views that person had. In some cases, 
and we can see in this specific point, there are several podcasts that are also broadcast on YouTube. They're, they have an immense number of views. And it's corroborating, and of course, we need to go deeper into this. If anyone asks me, I would say that we are closer to 20 to 25 million listeners, but we need to test this out. But this is a very large number in any case. Let's put it this way. If there's no growth, we're talking about 8% of the Brazilian population. Look how big that is. That's a lot of people. So this is something really cool. And in the listener survey for 2021, I hope that we can gather enough information to be able to calculate a closer number to our actual number of current listeners. As Andrea mentioned, we have here the links for all research items that we use to gather the data for this estimate. The data will be made available at the Pod Pesquisa website, abpod.org slash podpesquisa. I'd just like to thank everyone who has participated here and watched our live. This live will be translated into Spanish and English. We have a partner of ours, King Tradução. I really want to thank Arthur. He also has a podcast. He's a podcaster with Tagarelas. I'd like to thank him for his partnership. The texts will be translated as well. A part of it will be done by Alice Viralata. She's one of the participants at Big Tree, uh, one of the podcasts I participate in. So thank you very much, Alice. She is a great journalist. She lives in Mexico. Alice, thank you very much for your support. Andre, your friend who also worked with translation, we will have the translation of this material, this PDF that will be available for you. Just remember, we will have the PDF available for you, four pages, quite well organized, so you can look at it on your phone, you can share it on social media and so on and so forth. And we will have the Excel file. We will translate the PDF to English as well. I'd like to thank my friend Samantha, Samantha Albuquerque. She's a wonderful person. She works with me. She volunteered to do this, to translate this into English, so we can have the possibility of promoting Brazil to the world. That's perfect. Great. So, everyone, on my end, that's it. Julian, any other comments you would like to make? No, no, no. Let's go. A happy new year to everyone. We still have some live sessions with the producers, but I'll see you next time. Thank you very much if you stayed to the end. See ya. Bye-bye. See ya.